Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. When I was growing up, that's what we used to add weight to any of our words. If we made a promise, a vow, or some claim that was a little hard to believe, well, kids on the playground would protest as they do, liar, liar, pants on fire, hanging from the telephone wire. You remember that one? And we would pull out those words there to give weight to our vow, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Now, that's the kind of stuff that nightmares are made of. But I asked my kids, hey, kids, have you ever heard that before as I was preparing for this teaching? Is this still in common use? And, and you know, they gave me that look that every parent has seen many times. Dad, you are so out of it. You are so old school. You are so uncool. And apparently what has happened is that has been replaced by the pinky promise. I don't know if you know about the pinky promise, but the pinky promise is where you link your fingers, and there's variations of it. Sometimes you lick your fingers, kiss your fingers, link your pinkies, and all that kind of stuff. And the implication there of the pinky promise, parents, is this. If you break that promise, I'll break your finger. I'll break your pinky. And so our legal system is based on some of these kind of verifications, the verbal, the visible, that kind of stuff. Now, some of you are thinking, pinky promises? We don't do that for the president, you know, or poke in the eye with a needle. Some of you say, that sounds like something we should start to do with people who break their oath of office or whatever else, or their testimony in court. We might have a lot fewer people telling lies. But you see that in our courts, we have the people sometimes place their hands on the Holy Bible and repeat those words that you probably heard. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so for some, of course, you've heard maybe even in the news, they don't want to put their hand on the Bible. They don't believe it's God's word. They don't want to do that uh, either from a different belief system or no belief system at all. And so others maybe want to put their hand on a whole stack of Bibles. I don't know if you've ever seen someone who kind of validates their vows that way. You've seen the folks, you know, honest Abe's used car and bail bonds, that kind of person. They, they come out and say, hey, I'm, if I'm lying, I'm dying. And they try to tell you that a rusted car like this, you know, a hunk of junk off their lot there, as you see it on the title slide, well, that, that's really just a rare antique, you know. And I promise all it needs is a little wash, a little wax, that the baby's going to be back on the road. You'll never know that it was ever used before. And people throw that thing out again, you know, I swear to God about this. It was only driven to church by a little old lady on Sundays. Oh, yeah, on Saturdays. Yeah, it was Calvary Kindle. They do have a Saturday service. And Wednesdays. Yeah, sometimes Wednesdays. And, well, the men's study. Yeah, the, the men's study sometimes. And, and you start thinking, wait a minute, didn't he say it was owned by a little old lady? What's a little old lady doing going to the men's study? And that's when they start with the next little phrase. Maybe you've heard it. Well, to be honest with you, I hate when people say that in a, in a conversation because I realize, you mean up until this point it's all been dishonest? You know, well, no, honestly... On, to tell you the truth, and, and you can trust me, you can trust me. I swear on a stack of Bibles. You ever heard that? Now, the more a person says that kind of stuff, what do you do? The less you believe them, right? Why? Because it's not someone's hand on a closed Bible, on a bunch of Bibles even, that turns sinners into saints. It's when we begin to open the Bible, when we crack the cover and we open our hearts and our minds to the truth of God's word, that's when we are transformed. That's when we stop living a lie and maybe stop telling so many lies to ourselves and to others. And so the Bible itself says, you know what? Swearing shouldn't even be necessary in our lives. Why? Because if we're telling the truth and living the truth, well, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, the Sermon on the Mount, maybe you're familiar with it. He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't have to do all that stuff. Why? Because hopefully in Christ, as you have a Christ-like character, your truthful track record will speak for itself. And you don't have to add all that stuff to get someone to believe you. And so a promise, as we know, is only as good as the giver. It may be a great promise, but if it's given by someone who can't or won't perform it, it's not worth much. And so when I am given a promise, I always look at the character of the person who is saying it. And if they're of proven character, if their past suggests a faithful future, well, their word is enough. See, if Pastor Pedro tells me, for example, hey, Scott, I'll be there to pick you up at 7, I don't say, hey, pinky promise, come on, let's have it, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't say, hey, I'm sticking a needle in your eye if you're not there, you know. No, I don't have to do that. There doesn't have to be a tower of Bibles for him to do it, even though he probably does have one in his office. But you see that just his word is enough. Why? Because we have a friendship. We have a 
history there that I found him to be a faithful person over time. And so even the best people we know can break their promises, right? They can fail. That's why nobody ever swears on a stack of Bible commentaries. I mean, you know, nobody ever says, okay, bring me a commentary over here. A real godly guy, let's go ahead and, and uh, put the oath on that. Because as we've seen, and maybe we've experienced, and we know it even in our own lives, even godly people can promise and not perform. Sometimes on accident, sometimes on purpose. But we all fail to follow through sometimes. And human history suggests, you know what, the word of mankind is often worthless. That's what we find out. Maybe you know that from personal experience. But on the other hand, what you need to know, what I need to remember, and what that picture is painting there as people put their hand on that Bible. The word of God is different than the word of man. It's worthwhile. It's worthy. It's weighty. It's trusted. It's tried. It's true. It's proven itself over time. And so God's word is so full of vows and promises. And frankly, some of the stuff is even hard to believe at times. You look at it and go, wow, could it be? But remember this, God has a perfect track record, 100% accuracy. No word of God has ever failed. No word of God will ever fail. And that can't be said of any man. It's kind of funny, I think. Hebrews 6 Verse 13, if you write that one down and look at it later, I pinky promise it's there. It says that God promised to bless Abraham. And when he did that, it's kind of like he said, hmm, how can I take this oath? You know, people say, I swear to God. Who does God swear to? Well, it says that God says, I swear to me, Abraham. And that was the highest possible authority that anyone could appeal to. And so tonight we're going to look at God's word. And I hope if you have the heart that God wants you to have, that you would look at it with the kind of expectation that, you know what, God's word, every word in God's word matters. Even Numbers, chapter 28, 29, and 30, some of it, as you'll look at it, it has to do with feasts, it has to do with sacrifices, and sometimes when we're doing our devotional reading through these, we kind of speed read, you know, even if we're not a speed reader, you know, chapter 30, whoa, vows and oaths, I don't want to read that. And the thing is, sometimes we can say, you know, this doesn't relate to me very much. But you'll see, I think, first of all, that not only do the chapters relate to each other, they also relate to us. And so tonight we're going to try to be honest, at least with ourselves for a little while, and answer a couple of questions, which are, first of all, what is God's word worth to you? Really, what is God's word worth to you? Maybe you paid a little bit for your Bible, maybe you got a free one from the back, but really when it comes down to it, what is it worth to you? And what is your word worth to God and to others. And so God wants us to be people of his word, but he also, as we'll see, wants us to be people of our word. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, five powerful promises are found here in this section. A promise of forgiveness, a promise of freedom, a promise of fruitfulness, a promise of our future, and even a promise for our families. And so as We look at it here tonight, as I often say, don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Let's look at it together. It's in verse 1 of chapter 28. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel and say to them, My offering, my food for my offerings, should be made by fire as a sweet aroma to me. You shall be careful to offer to me at their appointed times. Now, as you look at that, You're going to see the me, me, my in there, and we'll talk about that. But this command here comes at the end of the wilderness wanderings, as you look at the chronology of this book. And it's really actually a repeat. This chapter here, or a couple of chapters, is repeat of information that we already looked at when we looked at Leviticus 23. Now, I'd invite you, if you would like, to get more information than I'm going to give you tonight about the feasts and the festivals and their prophetic element, and and I'll touch a little bit on it, but it was called Feast or Famine, Leviticus 23. It's available in the Media Center. And unfortunately, as you may know, as we looked at numbers, what was meant to be a feast for the people of God became a famine for them. And Acts chapter 7, verse 42 puts it this way. For 40 years, there were no offerings given to God, no feast, none of the things that God had commanded. The sacrificial system kind of laid dormant there for a while. And it was a time of disbelief. It was a time of disobedience. And a whole generation, as we saw, did not get to go into the promised land. Now, again, don't make the mistake that some make of thinking that saying that they didn't go into the promised land means that they didn't go to heaven. No, 
that's a, a much different thing as we'll see tonight. This is the talk of the promised life because obviously even Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. And so uh, we'll certainly see Moses in heaven. But it was a case of saved soul, wasted life. Ever met someone like that where you realize, hey, they've got faith in Christ, but you don't see the fruit of Christ so much in their life. And so it wasn't God's promises in their life that failed that kept them out of the promised land or the promised life. It was the fact that they failed to believe and receive all that God had for them. And God is a promise-making God, not a promise-breaking God. And so you see now a whole new generation at the end of the book about to enter the promised land. And as we'll see tonight, God always has the power to perform his promises. But there is a part that we play in it, and that's to believe and receive God's best for our lives, to trust his promises, to trust his power to bring these things about. Now, I mentioned in verse 2, it says, my, 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 me, me. Now, as a parent, when I hear that kind of stuff, I always think, ooh, sounds selfish. We're having a problem here. But that's not what's going on here. It's really just God making very clear, these are my commands. This is God-given stuff. And so we look at God's word here tonight, and it's these things that are at very specific times and in very specific ways, these sacrifices. And I like to put it this way, that there was a season for them and there was a reason for them. Daily sacrifices, we'll see the book unfold. It says daily sacrifice, weekly sacrifices, monthly and annual, all of those in that category. Now, some pagan religions, oftentimes people look at the Old Testament sometimes and go, oh, come on, this is such barbaric stuff, all this blood, all this sacrifice, and that, it's just like pagan practices today. Not at all. Although there is a lot of blood and guts certainly in there, the sacrifices here that we're talking about are God-given. They're different. They're full of symbolism. And the reason for them, the season for them was the Old Testament, but the reason for them was to point to the New Testament, to point to the person who proves all the promises of God and fulfills all of the promises of God. That's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so if you look with me at verse 3 here in Numbers 28, it says, You shall say to them, This is the offering made by fire, which you shall offer to the Lord, two male lambs in their first year without blemish, day by day as a regular burnt offering, the one lamb in the morning, the other lamb in the evening. Now, again, we have studied and, and commented on, I believe, the Old Testament sacrifices at many other times, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I do notice that nobody here brought a lamb tonight. Uh, I suspect that the ushers wouldn't let you in with it anyway. If you say, well, this is my seeing eye lamb or whatever, you know, somebody stuck a needle in my eye, I need, I need this. Well, no, we'd say, I, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And I suspect maybe that some of you sinned sometime today. I don't know for sure. I mean, maybe even on the way here, maybe even right now, but I don't know. But I would come to that question then and say, well, where's your sacrifice? Where's your lamb? And he said, come on, Scott, we don't need a sacrifice. Why not? Well, because a sacrifice was made once and for all. See, a Jew would wonder if they were to transport in time and come here and say, how could you come into this place full of sin with no sacrifice? Well, because we say, hey, a sacrifice was made for my sin, the Lamb of God. And every word in God's word matters. And there are two words that I want to highlight here tonight, which is verse 3, without blemish. And only Jesus can say that about himself without pride, and only he can say it in truth, without blemish. Never a lie, never a sin, never an exaggeration even. Perfect performance. Perfect promises, perfect person, the only one that ever lived. And so you see in the Old Testament, there was this repetition of the sacrifice. It was like a daily thing, I, every morning, every night, week to week, month to month, year to year, over and over and over again. But then in the New Testament, you see that come to an end because there is Jesus once and for all, as God's word says. One sacrifice for all. Forgiveness. That's the promise that is found here in the Old Testament. We have it day in and day out. Why? Because we need it day in and day out. We have that morning and the evening. Sometimes it's the morning. Okay, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do today. <laughs> you know, and then, oh, I did it. I thought I wouldn't, and I did. I said I wouldn't, and I have. Now, how do I know I'm forgiven as a person? You know, we don't want to make light of it in a sense. Well, first of all, we can Know that simply because we have God's word on it. And God's word for forgiveness is Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7, 
I quote this one for you. It's first, the first chapter of Ephesians, verse 7. It says, in him, it's talking about Jesus. We have redemption through his blood, not the blood of a lamb, but the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So God promised forgiveness, but see, certainly Jesus proves it for us in no uncertain terms. We have God's word on it. But I like always to be very practical. How can I know that I have forgiveness? How can I know that I really have it? Well, I believe one of the ways we can know is when we can begin to give it. See, we know we've got it when we can begin to give it. If I have a cold, how do I know I got it? Well, hey, I can give it, right? Well, that's the same thing on the positive side with forgiveness. A lot of people are really willing and they just love the idea that God will forgive them. But then it comes the call to forgive and they whoa, wait a minute Wait a minute, I'm not going to do that. That person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Do you realize how much they've wronged me, all that kind of stuff? But here's the thing. When we are forgiven, we begin to be forgiving. It's not only our sins that are the problem, are they? Because, of course, we all have sinned against others and against God, but others have sinned against us, haven't they? And those are the ones we really remember, and those are the ones that really cause us sometimes to sin in bitterness and everything else. And I think of it this way. I don't want to point out his sin. He's my son. But uh, somehow he inherited, I think, through his mother. I'm not 100% sure. But, but all of our kids are, were, were sinners. And, and so you see that, uh, Stephen, I'm so proud of him. He's an awesome guy. He uh, loves to play basketball. Any of you who have been here for a while probably have seen him out there. As a matter of fact, as one family said, it was weird. We went to Jackson Memorial Hospital, and on the way there, we saw your son playing basketball. And then we had a whole doctor's appointment. You know how long those can go. And we're coming back along the turnpike. The sun is set, and there's your son still out there shooting baskets. But he takes it very seriously, and he does very well with it. But he's also at the YMCA, and the YMCA is kind of a foul fest. I got to put it that way. You know, they, it's not the NBA, and Stephen is always saying, this is not the NBA, Dad. They didn't call that right. You know, he knows a lot about basketball. And so we used to have a saying on the playground, no blood, no foul. You know that one, which is if nobody's bleeding, you keep playing, you know. And even if they are, you just wipe it off and keep going. But the other day during a game, there was a particularly flagrant foul. I mean, everybody saw it except one person, which was the ref. No whistle at all. And so, you know, here's the thing. I'm watching Stephen's face as I'm doing this as a father, and it's all twisted up. And I know he's thinking. It's not, it's not that he got hurt. It's that he was upset about it. And he's thinking about that old foul. But here's the problem. He kept playing, but he was playing kind of poorly for a while. Why? Because he, the game's still going on, but he's thinking about that foul that happened. And now it's the fourth quarter. And the foul happened in the first quarter. And so he's still thinking about that first quarter foul in the fourth quarter. And there was a timeout taken, and I went over to him, and I said, son, get in the game. you got to get in the game now. There's a game going on. I know you got fouled way back there, and it was flagrant, and it wasn't fair, and all the rest. But you got to forget that foul. And it's part of the past. And you got to play in the present. And by God's grace, he did that and went on to win. Now, you think about that. That's what forgiveness does. See, ultimately, it frees you. A lot of times people say, oh, I'm not going to forgive that person. Well, then you will stay a prisoner of the pain of your past forever, and that person hurts you twice, not only when they hurt you, but they keep hurting you over and over again, and forgiveness frees you. So the promise that God gives is not only that your sin can be forgiven, but other sin can be forgiven so you can go on and get in the game. Now, you see the yearly sacrifices here, seven special feasts. Seven special feasts, and they had historical significance. And again, if you want to look at it later, go back to Leviticus 23. There's a ton about it in there and in that teaching. But there's also a prophetic purpose and a very practical purpose in it. These feasts, I'm so fascinated. The more I know about the Word of God, the more I realize how little I know about the Word of God, but how much there is to know about the Word of God. And you start seeing things and going, man, this can't be the Word of man. There's just so much to it. No man is this smart. And so you see verse 16, the first feast, the first feast, the Passover promise. What was it? It was a promise of freedom. You see it in Exodus 12, and it was 10 plagues, and the last was the worst, the death of the firstborn son. You may know that story. And so the Jews would be spared if they did what God said. If they put the blood of a perfect lamb over the doorpost, they took God at his word. You say, how could that possibly help? Well, by faith they did it, those that did. 
They took a perfect lamb. They spread the blood there over the door. And the angel of death passed over that day. That's why they call it Passover. And so the Egyptians let them go at that point. They said, hey, we don't want you around here. We don't want anything to do with you or your God. And so there was freedom there for the people of God, set free from slavery and death. But there's a spiritual significance to that event, which is freedom from sin. All the way throughout the scripture, it's referred back to for a purpose. Yes, it had a season. It had a reason back then. But now... We have a different reason for it, a different understanding of it. The greatest bondage in our lives is not physical, it's spiritual. If you've ever looked at a life or lived a life of an addict, you know what I'm talking about. Somebody who's just in slavery, they don't even want to do it anymore. They don't even get any pleasure out of it anymore, but they're trapped in it. Not just drugs or alcohol, it can be so many things. A, a bondage to pride. Or selfish ambition, you know, I just got to get more stuff and more things and more applause and all that kind of stuff. Lying or stealing or some of these things. Always looking over your shoulder, never free. Because always living in fear of being found out. And you see that promise that God wants to give to us, which is, listen, I want to forgive you, but I also want to free you. I don't want to just forgive you of the penalty of sin. I want to free you from the power of sin over your life so it's no longer your master. I want to be a different master, a better master than sin in your life. And so the prophetic idea here behind the Passover was freedom. And Jesus is the word for freedom. Again, I say in God's word. Passover is the very day you may know that Jesus was crucified. But don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. It's 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And it says this. Even Christ, our Passover, was sacrifice for us and if you look at the chronology again it's to the very day all those years of sacrificing those lambs it was just pointing forward to this one day in which jesus would become the sacrifice for the sins of the world and so the second feast that you see in here it was pointing to the passover and that's a promise of freedom in our lives now verse 16 if you look at it with me it's coupled with Another feast on the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. But then on the 15th day of the of the month is the feast of the unleavened bread, which shall be eaten for seven days. Now, so you're seeing here the Passover and then the next day starts another feast, just kind of back to back there. Unleavened bread, a no yeast free feast. That's what it means. No yeast, seven days, flat bread. Now, some of you, if you were to go to a party and they had a platter there of matzo, you'd say, what kind of party is this, man? I should have brought something a little better. But remember, the whole idea here of this feast was a celebration of freedom from Sin And all throughout the scripture, you see yeast as a picture, as an analogy of, ye- of sin. What does yeast do? It puffs things up. And what does sin do? It puffs people up in pride. And you just kind of go, and they're empty inside. And so you see yeast being that. And there's no yeast feast here. Note that it was after the Passover, not before. Now, why does that matter? What's the message there? Well, again, God's word, we take it seriously, I hope, here. And what it means, just that simple thing, order matters. Every word in God's word matters. Don't wait until you come clean to come to Christ. See, that's what it's saying there. You're saying, okay, wait, here's what I'll do. I'll put the unleavened part first and then the Passover. No, it doesn't work that way. The Passover always has to come first and then the cleansing, then the lack of sin, the lack of yeast. So many people make the mistake of promising to do better promising to be different without the power of God inside their life. See, they're there maybe praying to the porcelain God. You know, everybody's got a God. Oh, I promise I will never drink this much again, you know, or something like that. And, I, and they may even mean it very much. I don't want to do this. Pleading maybe with someone, look, I'm sorry for what I said, or I didn't mean to hit you. I'll, I'll do better, baby. I promise. I promise. And then someone says, hey, do you want to come to Christ? No, I'm too messed up for that, man. I I, I can't go to church. I can't do these things. I need need to clean my life up. Then I'll come to God. But see, if you're trying to be good without God, it's not possible. It's never going to happen. You might even get sober. You might even make some adjustments on the outside and stop lying and cheating and doing some of these things. But here's the problem. It just swings to the other side, and then a person becomes self-righteous. Hey, look what I have done in the power of my mind and positive thinking. No, wait a minute. 
God says it's an inside job. That's the real problem. And the Passover and the, the Passover and the unleavened bread, they're that promise of freedom, and they go in that order, and it never is going to be any different than that. We'll never be able to say, hey, get clean, then come to Christ. No, come to Christ, that's the only way to ever get clean from the penalty and power of sin. Now, what you see is we have the promise of forgiveness. We've already seen that in here. We have God's word on it. We also have the promise of freedom. We have God's word on it. We have a promise of fruitfulness. We have God's word on it as we see here tonight. Numbers 28, verse 26. There's two feasts again mentioned in one verse. The day of first fruits and the feast of weeks. That's in verse 26. Verse 26 of chapter 28. Two feasts mentioned in one verse. Spot here. Let me read it with you. It says, also in the day of the first fruits, that's a day, when you bring a new grain offering to the Lord at your feast of weeks, that's a week, uh, that's that's an ongoing feast, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work, and you shall present a burnt offering as a sweet aroma to the Lord, two young bulls, one ram, seven lambs in their first year. Now, it talks about the day of first fruits. And that was part of the Passover. It was actually on a Sunday. It's awesome. I, I'm passing over a lot of the detail here, and, and I hate to do that, but I have to do that just because of the ground we're covering tonight. But this is tied to the resurrection of Christ. Again, the intricacy of God's word is just simply amazing. You see him dying on Passover. That's the day he died. You can back up the calendar and know that. And then he rose again on the Sunday, the day of first fruits. Coincidence? I think not. God incidents. But don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. It says 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. That's what it's talking about there, of those who've fallen asleep. It's talking about those who died. So first fruits, a promise of more to come. That's what it means. It means the first fruits, which means there's going to be more fruits to follow. And, and Christ was raised from the dead. And all that's saying is, hey, his resurrection proves our resurrection. The promise that God said, hey, you will resurrect if you believe in me. You will resurrect to eternal life. And he did, and so we will. And you see the Feast of Weeks. This is an important one. This was 50 days after Passover. Pentecost, you may know it that way. Sometimes people say, oh, is this a Pentecostal church? Well, I don't know. Depends on what you mean about that. We certainly believe in Pentecost. And you see verse 27, various sacrifices Verse 27, if you look at it, you'll see a ram, a lamb, a ding-dong. Now, some of you you are way too young to know what that's all about. But a ram, a lamb, a ding-dong, it was a a song. I'm old school. I'm not cool. But a ram, a lamb, not a ding-dong, a bull, a goat, a grain, a drink offering, lots and lots of sacrifices on that day, all kinds of stuff going on. Historical significance, what was it? A celebration of the harvest, of the abundance that God had given them. And the spiritual significance, just going through it real quickly, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. That's where you'll find Pentecost's actual real live meaning, far beyond just physical fruit. I mean, that's kind of like, yeah, okay, God gave us a lot of fruits and veggies, that's nice. But there's something so much more than that. Acts 2, the birth of the church, that's what you see there, the Holy Spirit upon them. And this is the performance of a promise. This is the fulfillment of, a fulfillment of a promise, a promise of power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is what God had, God had said. Jesus says to his disciples, you know what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, not only here, but all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, Again, one of those words, when we think of power, sometimes we're, oh boy, power, that's going to be exciting, you know? But think about it this way, again, power for what? Well, remember, this is intricately linked with the first fruits and with the harvest there of Pentecost, which is all about fruitfulness. And we have God's word on it, and that's really important for us to see, that we, the real promise of power here is that we will have fruitful lives, fruitful lives that we will be full of the Holy Spirit, and because of that, we will be fruit-filled. Now, I'm not talking about being a fruit cake. You know what I'm talking about there with fruit cake? People, hey, I'm full of the Spirit. I'm shaking all over and sweating, all that kind of stuff, and I'm hitting people in the forehead and all that kind of stuff. You've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. I was watching one YouTube thing, a guy swinging his jacket around, and bang, you know, just knocking people over, and you go, wait a minute. Is that full of the Holy Spirit? No, that's fruity, all right. 
But here's the thing. We have God's word on it. What does that mean? That means if we don't see it in God's word, we shouldn't see it in God's church. I don't think. And so what's the promise? The promise of power. The pra- power blah, 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 blah. Speaking in tongues. See? We believe in it. Now, the promise to be a witness. What is a witness? A real witness to this world. What does the world really want to see? Well, I know what they don't want to see. They don't want to see hypocrisy. (laughs) They want to see something a little different. They want to see spiritual fruit. They want to see Christ-like character. That's what they're really hungry for. Fruit-filled believers. What's the primary evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I believe Galatians 3.22 says it really well. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, Peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Wow, those are interesting things. So it's really not how high a person can fly on Sunday, but how straight they can walk from Monday through Saturday. See, people will decide what God's word is worth largely when they look at our lives and see what our word is worth and what our life is lived for. And so this is really, I believe, a great place for a chapter break, and that's where you find it in chapter 39. The first four feasts there, those annual feasts that are being discussed, it's important to see that those were in the first part of the year, okay? There's seven total feasts that we're going to talk about tonight. The first four we've already talked about. But notice with me something here, again in God's Word, Numbers 29, it starts with these words, and in the seventh month. Do you see that there? Verse 1, chapter 29, in the seventh month. Now, why does that matter? Well, I always take advantage of this time to say I was born in the seventh month, on the 11th day, 7-11. It's, uh, you can remember it from Slurpee. So if you're thinking now about what you're getting me for my birthday, I know you are. I'll be 41. You can think about that for a little while and, and think what you're going to get. That's why I mentioned the seventh month. No, it's not why I mentioned the seventh month. The seventh month is, is this. It's an important number in the Bible. Now, I'm not one of those people who are kind of like into, maybe you've met some of those, some other fruit cakey things, you know, where they all think there's hidden messages in the Bible. Did you know, I swear to God, I swear to God, dude, well, watch this. If you take the first letter, like of every word in Revelation 1 and like, and like read it backwards, it's like the course to like stairway to heaven, dude. I am so freaked out. And I, it, I just, I think it also has the winning lotto numbers, man. No. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Even the most conservative scholars in the world of the Bible will say that seven has a significance. It's a special number in God's word and in God's world. You see the seven days of creation. You see the seven sacred feasts here in the Jewish calendar. You see the seven-layer burrito at Taco Bell. (laughs) Well, maybe that's from somewhere else. But but in the scriptures, this is what you see. Seven is the number of completion and perfection. It is the... Fullness, the fulfillment, there's nothing more after seven except to start over again. And so you see seven being a very important number. And this is the key to understanding really this part of the teaching. So please pay very close attention, which is that Jesus came, but Jesus is coming again. That's the promise of the future that we find, even woven into these very Jewish feasts. You see, You don't have to take my word for it. You can take God's word for it, that on God's calendar, there are these three feasts. You're seeing it here in the Old Testament. There's three feasts in the first month, and then there are three more in the seventh month, and there's kind of Pentecost in between. And and so what you're seeing, we've already talked about the significance of some of those, but I'll say it again. The first four feasts there are fulfilled, really, in the coming of Christ the first time, the first time. You see, the Passover, that was the perfect lamb, crucified for our sin, sacrificed for our sin. The unleavened bread, well, that's the sin dealt with after that fact. And you see the first fruits with him being raised again on that Sunday that follows. And then you see Pentecost, the birth of the church, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But after Pentecost, then what? Well, a lot of years have gone by, haven't they? And so you see that symbolically in those four feasts, four months go by. Bunch of stuff going by. Looking forward to that seventh month. I'm sure they were. I don't know if you know those stretches of our calendar where there's no vacation days, you know, and you're kind of like, uh, isn't there something soon, like groundhog something? Can't we take something off soon? But that's what you see them having these kind of anticipation of that seventh month. Man, here comes the seventh month. Here it comes. Completion, perfection for them, but a promise of the future for us. 
The second set of feasts will find their fulfillment ultimately in the second coming of Christ. And you'll see, we've talked already about forgiveness, freedom, fruitfulness, but I want to talk about the promise of the future. The Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. And again, I'm not going to have time to go into a lot of detail on these, but they, you can find it in other places, specifically Leviticus 23. So in the seventh month, if I say that enough times, Maybe at least my mom will get it. Okay, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. For you, it's a day of blowing of the trumpets. That's why it's called the Feast of Trumpets. And you shall offer a burnt sacrifice, and you see the same things that they talk about in some other places. Now, this is something that might be known to you by a more modern name of it, but it's Rosh Hashanah. It's the uh, Jewish actual New Year, and they have two... Uh, celebrations, you see the, the civic year, you see the, the religious year, because you may say, wasn't the other the first part of the year? But that's the thing, they have two, and pretty smart, nice idea. But they have the, the new year here, and it's not fireworks, but trumpets. They, they make some noise, and they blast these things off. Now, here's the thing, in the Bible, if you know your Bibles well, you know there's a lot of talk of trumpets. And one of the most important and interesting ones is in 1 Thessalonians 4, Verse 13, what is that? That is the rapture of the church that comes before the tribulation there. The first Thessalonians 4, 13, it says, through the voice of the trumpet, and you know what? We're going to be gathered to be with God. And there's also another place where it talks of the trumpet, the restoration of Israel after the tribulation, Matthew 24, verse 31. It talks about that too, and it says, you know, the blowing of the trumpet. Now, again, sometimes people want to, debate back and forth about these, but here's the thing. I just say, hey, take your pit. You know, there's lots of trumpets, two trumpets, doesn't matter. I believe it refers to both or either. But you see the proof of the promise that Jesus said, hey, I'll be back. You know, it wasn't Schwarzenegger who said that first. We didn't realize he'd come back as a governor, but, you know, he says, I'll be back. But, but Jesus is coming back also as a governor, a greater governor, a greater king. And so you see Numbers 29, verse Seven, the, the next feast that we talk about, and again, we're going at breakneck speed, but here's the thing, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. In the tenth of the seventh month, there it is again, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall afflict your souls. Now, I could talk a lot about that, but you can probably just surmise from it, it's not a particularly happy thing, whatever that is. And you shall not do any work. Well, that sounds good, but afflicting my soul, I don't know if I want to do I'd rather go to work. Now, Key phrase there in verse 7 is afflict your souls. And unlike the other holy days, this one is very different. All the rest were feasting and a celebration. We were having a great time, but there's this day of atonement that was not a feast. It was a fast. It was a famine. It was a serious and somber day. And again, the modern day equivalent that you may know about it, Jews would call it Yom Kippur. It's, a, it's kind of a pity party, frankly. It's mourning and fasting and repenting. Interestingly enough, they're supposed to have sacrifices, but they don't have sacrifices. They just feel sorry for their sin. But that's not enough, as the Bible has shown very clearly. Where is your sacrifice? And this is a picture of the day in the future when Israel, as a nation, as a whole, will realize we missed the Messiah the first time around. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Zechariah 12, verse 10. It's one of the messianic prophecies. But it's about the second coming of Christ. And it says, God's word says this. Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour on the house of David. That's Israel on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him. It's interesting because it says they'll look on me. Yeah, they'll mourn for him. You see that equivalency there between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You see in it, but it says, they'll look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So the seventh and final feast in the Jewish calendar here, in the word of God for us here tonight, it's the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's Numbers 29, 12 through 38. Now, if you love math problems, you should go through this one and, and just write down all the different sacrifices and add them up. We won't do that here tonight. But here's the thing. This was a harvest hoedown. This was the most elaborate of all the feasts. This was the feast to end all feasts, literally. And so you see, historically, what was it? It was booths. It was, goes by many names, but it was the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, and they were living in tents at this time. This is what they would do. They would intentionally go get in a tent, you know, and it was to contrast it with their permanent place. I mean, they're living high on the hog now. Well, not high on the hog. They're Jewish, you know, but, but you understand what I'm saying. They're, they're doing well. 
here having this harvest. And they go, well, let's go get in a tent. Yeah, that sounds fun. Nothing like 10 or eight days in a tent to remember just how good you've got it in the house. You know what I'm talking about? It's fun to go out there and, 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 and go camping or something, but it's great fun to get back. And so you see what he's doing here is this final feast. It's a picture of that last eternal feast, the eternal day, tabernacles, tents. The Bible talks about our body as a tent and just says, hey, that's a temporary thing, but I got something a whole lot more permanent for you. That's the promise of the future that God has for us. Don't take my word for it. God, take God's word for it. Jesus said to his disciples, you know what? If it weren't so, I would have told you because I always told you the truth. And he says, you know what? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you'll be with me also. This is just temporary, guys, but I've got something a whole lot more permanent than that. And so this is the final verse here of chapter 29, uh, verse 40, and it says, Moses took the children of Israel and told them everything just as the Lord had commanded him. Now, in a way, it'd be nice to stop there. You know, you say, okay, Numbers 28 and 29. Wow, that was a lot of information. My brain's kind of full. Can I go now? You know, well, God's word, here's the thing. It has lots of great vows. It has lots of great promises in it. We saw them. We saw forgiveness. We saw freedom. We see fruitfulness. We see a future. And you go, man, that's awesome. Wow, what a vow. I mean, God just really doing some cool stuff. Isn't his word wonderful? Aren't God's promises just so perfect and amazing? And then I would say, yeah, yeah. Now, what about our word? What about our word? Oh, wow, now that's getting a little too personal. See, I can learn all that prophecy stuff, and my life doesn't have to change. But what if, what if I'm challenged to change on a personal level? Well, that's a whole different thing. See, what is our word worth? Hopefully you get a little taste of what God's word is worth. It's prophetically and historically perfect, morally perfect. It's amazing. It, it boggles the mind when you start to look at it sometimes. But then we get back to the very practical point of what is his word do about our word? See, Numbers 30, that's what you see. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to, a Lord, to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. And he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Now, that's talking there about vows, swearing an oath. It's just basically saying, hey, I promise, you know, we have those things in our society. And notice these were voluntary vows. It's real important to see that. The, the things that were described before, that was God's word and it was God's command. And he said, you, you have to have these sacrifices, these feasts, these things to point forward to these important purposes of mine. But this is the thing. These things were voluntary. These were things that says, hey, I come up with some. I want to say it. I need to do it. No one twisted their arm, but God does now expect them to keep their word. That's what we're seeing in this. And the primary points of tonight's teaching, just to boil them down, is that God's word matters to us, and I hope it does to you. But here's the thing. Our word matters to God. That's an important one to see, too, that both of those are true. And chapters 28 and 29, God's made a promise here. He says, you know, I'm a promise-making God, and I'm a promise-keeping God, and I will do what I say I will do. And then in chapter 30, he says kind of, hey, what about you? I want your word to look somewhat like my word. I mean, his word is everything, but our word ought to mean something. And so God uses an example where many vows are spoken and broken, and that's the family. And you see here, he boils it down in verse 2 so simply. It just says, hey, your vows are binding. But then he goes on to give some exceptions. And it talks in this chapter about a daughter and a wife, that their word could be overruled. Now, stick with me. Don't get mad at me. Hey, it's not my word. It's God's word. We're going to read it together. But we'll see that there's no reason even to get mad at God over this one. Now, verse 3, it says, Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house, in her youth, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she's bound herself, and her father holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on that day that he hears it, then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she's bound herself shall stand. And the Lord will release her because her father overruled her. Now, there might be some chauvinists here tonight who are already thinking, yeah, man, God says this because he knows how women are. Man, you just can't trust them. You can't believe a word they say. 
No, that's not it at all. You've misread and misunderstood. The word says this because God knows how we all are, man, woman, and child. He knows that oftentimes our word is pretty worthless and that we are all sinners. And here's the thing. When you put a bunch of sinners in a place, you're going to have problems. And God knows a house full of sinners, be it big or small, needs a head. And we know in nature even, you know, if something has two heads, it's a monster. And if it has no head, well, it's dead. And so God has made the man the head of the house. Now, that's not my word. It's God's word. You find it in Ephesians 5 and some other places. But again, some of the most misunderstood sections of Scripture. And the truth is, I would rather not be the head of the house. If, if, I, could, if I could be that transparent with you, I'd rather not really. It's kind of easier to be passive and uninvolved. And there's a lot of people who complain about exactly that. See, I do a lot of marital counsel. And I find that a lot of ladies are saying, I wish somebody would be the head of this house so I don't have to be. And here's the thing. God's word says it to me. And it's not a bunch of rights. It's a bunch of responsibilities. It says to me, hey, Scott, you vowed to honor and to cherish and to serve Len. And nobody held a gun to your head. And I want you to keep that vow. I want you to keep your word by keeping my word. That's the only way you'll be able to do it. And God's word comes with so many promises to our families. He basically says, you know what? Your family will flourish if you do it my way. And our society has pretty much tossed out the scriptures, tossed out the Bible, tossed out God's word and God's way, and we see the effects. The family went with it. And so what is Numbers 30 saying? Look at it with me. The first part, it just basically says, hey, the king of the castle sure isn't the kids. If a seven-year-old kid living at home makes a vow, it isn't binding unless the dad agrees. It's kind of like this. You know, if my daughter says, hey, dad, I vowed with your visa card. I found it in the drawer. I vowed to Toys R Us. Well, guess what? If I say, no, 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 then it's not binding. But if I stand there smiling while they put all the stuff into the truck and take it to our house, hey, well, you know what? Now it's my vow. It's not her vow. It's my vow. And it's my problem, and it's my promise, and I need to keep it. I never should have made it. And then you see the second part. Well, it's that husband and wife need to present one unified front when it comes to decision making. And if Lynn makes a vow, my wife says, well, you can have our cow. We don't have a cow, but you can have our cow. Well, you know what? I can't have a cow if I didn't say anything about it at the time and I just let it go on. And I silence his consent. That's what it says here in this part here. No, you know what? It's our vow now. And buy to our cow. And it's our promise and our problem when you think of those things. Now, again, notice in the scriptures, there's even a section here where it says, you know what, a widow woman, a divorced woman, she's free to make her own promises, but she's responsible to follow through on them just like a man. So it doesn't have anything with gender differences. It's structure, it's integrity, it's honesty. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about a man making a vow. This seems so foreign today, but this is what it's all about. A, a man making a vow to lovingly lead his wife. And a wife to say, you know what? I vow to faithfully follow you and God. And ladies, some of you would say right away, no, no, see, I don't want that. I don't want to answer to anybody. But that's the thing. You say, cool, stay single. No, 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 I want to get married. Okay, well, it's easy to get married. The question is whether you stay married. That's a question because it's easy to get married. It's sometimes hard to stay married. The only way, in fact, to stay married that I know of, to stay happily married any, anyway, is to marry and do it God's way. Marry a man who obeys God's word. A man of his word, a man of God's word. That's what you want, ladies. A guy who will keep his vow to love you as Christ loved the church. Not to lord over you. What did Jesus do? He laid down his life for the bride. We're all the bride of Christ. Now, I, sometimes guys don't like that. It's just an analogy. You all make a beautiful bride. Don't, don't wear white. But you understand what I'm saying. You see in there that that's it. And ladies, if you want to have a great marriage, you know what? You need to let him be the head, even if he doesn't really want to be, because that's part of the growth process to make him a man. Let him be the head. And some of you say, man, I wish I had one. You know, I married a jerk. <laughs> I have a head, but he's kind of a deadhead, you know? Well, First <laughs> Peter 3, 
1 Peter 3, don't take my word for it, take God's word for it. 1 Peter 3, it says to win him without a word. That your word isn't the word that's going to win him. It's when he sees God's word living in you, that's when he's going to be won. Headship, leadership, it's not a right, it's a responsibility. And so God has a promise for our families. Now, many at this point would say, this is such a sensitive subject, I just can't even believe you talk about it. Well, God's word talks about it. And my intention and God's intention is not to heap condemnation or pain on anybody. See, so many people would say, well, my family's fractured. You don't understand. There's a lot of friction and fighting in there. But remember God's promises. Remember what we already talked about. God's word. Well, it has many promises to families. And one of the things I love about this ministry is we see a lot of fixed families here as God's word gets in here. Remember God's promises. Forgiveness. That's a biggie. Freedom. That's a big one fruitfulness and the future and remembering those things that we're just passing through here. But the biggest change that God always wants to bring is it always starts with us. See, that's the thing. I need some change. You know, that person needs to change. This person needs to change. My family needs to change. God always says, hey, let's start with you. Let's start with you. Now, that said, one of the biggest things that can happen in a person's life is they begin to make promises to God. All right, God, I promise I'll do better. I vow to do different. I'll be so much better you won't even recognize me. And they'll go home and they'll tell everybody, you know, you come back from a retreat and you go, that's it. I'm never going to sin again, baby. It's going to be awesome. I promise. But here's the thing. When God is doing the work, we don't have to swear on a stack of Bibles to get people to believe us. I remember coming home from a conference and right before we left, the speaker said this, hey guys, don't go promise your wife you're gonna change. Just go change, she'll notice. You know, that's what it's great because so many times they've heard it all before, promise, 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 yeah, just another broken promise. But here's the thing, when God's doing the work, it's undeniable and you see God's faithful and we still play a part in it. So I just wanna close out with a thought, a, a illustration, there was a man who was pressure cleaning a roof, and he was way up on a building, you know, 10 stories high or more, and he's up there pressure cleaning it, and if you've ever been doing that, you know, it can get a little slippery, and so he, he did slip, and he started to slide down the roof there and off toward the edge, and so he did what any of us would do. He called out to God, oh, God, help me, help me, I promise I'll be a better father, I'll be different, I'll give up the drink, and I'll do all these things, I pro I'll give my money to the missionaries, in fact, I'll be a missionary, you just got to save me, God, I don't know if you've ever been in one of those situations, and so he's tumbling down, he's sliding, and the edge is coming, and everything, and all of a sudden, his shirt catches on a roofing nail right at the edge, and he says this, oh, God, never mind, uh, you know, all that stuff, I promise, I don't need it, this, this nail saved me, this nail caught me. I'm okay. I, I take all that stuff back. Now, you think about that. You know, it happens so often because we find out that our promises, well, they're not really worth that much. God does expect us to keep our word. We've seen that. But he really knows that our word is not enough. Our power is not enough. Our ability is insufficient. And so what you see is we don't need our word to God, we need his word to us. And I am so thankful that I can stand here and tell you that, you know, it's not my vow of faithfulness to God that gives me security, that gives me peace, that gives me joy and all the things that Jesus has brought into my life. It's not me saying, God, I'll do this for you and I'll do that and I'll be so much better. You know what? It's not that that saves me. It's not that that keeps me. It's his promise of faithfulness to me. That's the promise that'll never fail. And the sacrifices, you may remember, I want to burn this into our brains. The sacrifice, when we saw it, what were they? They were without blemish. Remember those two words? Without blemish. But it wasn't the person bringing the lamb as a sacrifice that had to be without blemish. The very fact that they brought the lamb was recognition that they aren't without blemish. And so that is the declaration that every honest heart makes. You know, I need something better than me, something bigger than I. My word has failed, and God's word will never, ever, ever do that. And so we think about the promises of God, but certainly Jesus is yes to all of those, but he is the provision of God, and it was free, but it wasn't cheap. Remember that saying that we had as kids? Hey, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, but we never really did that. But then you think about Jesus, 
It wasn't just cross my heart. I mean, he went to the cross. And he didn't just hope to die. He died to give us hope. That's the bottom line there. He did die. He didn't just make an empty promise. He did it. He laid down his life. And stick a needle? Well, if that's all they did, as disgusting as that is, they did so much more and so much worse to Jesus there. Razor sharp thorns on his head, beat into his head. Nails in his hands and in his feet. A whip on his back. And that wasn't the worst of it as we've discussed before. It's the physical suffering certainly was there. But it was the sin of the world being laid upon him for the perfect Lamb of God to shoulder the sin of the world. What a disgusting thing that was. I just think of my sin alone poured on him would be a disgusting thing. But all that was to prove the promises that God has made throughout his word, to validate the vows that he's made. You know what? He says so many times to us, hey, I give you forgiveness. And to prove it, I'm not just going to send a lamb. I'm going to send myself. I'm going to send my son. You have my word. I've even signed everything that I've said in my own blood. And so the big question in every life is, do you have God's word? Not just sitting on a shelf somewhere or even holding it in your hand, but in your heart. And the great thing about the the bible is it really came to life in a life see it's not the bible the bible is a wonderful book but sometimes i think people even revere it as if it was something sacred and magical no it's not it's just the word of god about god and so when you think about that the bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us And it's talking there in John chapter 1 about Jesus himself. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The living word. Not just the Bible, but the author of the Bible came to live among us. Now, why did he do that? Because he knew that it wasn't just for us to read the truth, but for us to know him in a real relationship. That's the whole point. And it says in John 1 in that same section that those who received him, that those who believed in him, he gave them the right to be the part of the best family in the whole world better than any dysfunctional family because every physical family is dysfunctional one way or another but God's family with him as your father you got a perfect father there and what you see is it says to him that believed and received Jesus he gave the right to become children of God and so I give you that opportunity tonight as we do every time and I just want to talk briefly to anyone who's never made a decision to let Jesus into their heart, into their life as Lord, as Savior, as Master. Now, some would say, well, I think I've done that. I don't know. Listen, if you don't know for sure, you need to make a decision for sure. Why? Because if the creator of the universe comes into your heart, you're going to know. And other people might notice as well. And so it might take some time, but it will be an evidence that is there. And so what I want to do is just take some time to pray for you and if that is you here tonight we're just going to bow our heads close our eyes and if it's you that i'm speaking to i'm just going to ask you at the end of the time to raise your hand and i want you to think about this as we think about it just thinking it through the passover lamb the passover lamb was personal see it wasn't something that they just said okay well hey he's really fluffy he's really nice what a wonderful perfect flawless lamb no they actually not only put the blood of the lamb over their doorpost in in faith but they ate of that lamb they took that lamb within and it was the strength for the journey that they were about to take out into that wilderness and onto the promised land and so you see those things you say man there's a lot of symbolism there it's more than just some wow isn't jesus cool i think he's out there somewhere and i sure am impressed with him no it's when you say i know him because he is in me christ in you the hope of glory And again, he's given many promises in your life, but those things are only to those who have him in their hearts. What you see is that power of forgiveness. Man, you need that. The power and freedom to say, I want to be away from that stuff. I want to be mastered by a new master. Someone who would say, I want to have a life that's fruitful, not fruitless. I want to be somebody who has and knows that I've got a future and I even want to be a part of the family of God. That's what you're joining, not a church, but God is your father. And so let's pray together. And if uh, that's you here tonight, I just invite you to acknowledge it by raising your hand. Lord, we do thank you tonight that we can come before you forgiven, that we can come before you free. 
And Lord, that we can experience the things that your word says. But Lord, it's so tempting for us to try to promise to you or work it out in our own power. But so freeing when we find that it's your promise to us, not our promise to you, that's going to change. Not only our lives, but the lives of those around us. And we thank you for the promises you've given us and the power that is brought by your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.